I, it was just physically impossible for Muslims to pull this off and the sophistication and everything. Never forget that Islam and Muslims had nothing to do with 9-11 and stopped using us as the escape the, the Bedouin said, when's the hour? And the prophet, peace be upon him, said, when honesty is lost. And the Bedouin said, well, prophet, Allah's messenger, how can honesty be lost? Me and I was just being thrown around and I didn't know where I was and it was very scary. And then all of a sudden I said Allah and all of a sudden it was like snap. And I, I saw and I saw a being in front of me sitting, smiling. I couldn't see his face, but I felt a huge smile on me. I don't know how to describe it. All I saw was... I-S-L-A-M. Islam says love all mankind, and that's why we're sharing this message. Peace acquired by submission to the one and only one creator of the heavens and earth, God Almighty Allah. This is the day, the day How are you this doing? Alhamdulillah, please forgive my technological handicaps. <laughs> no worries, no worries. How you been? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Good. Good. And you? Good. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. How's, uh, how's, um, how are you handling the whole, uh, the whole situation? The, what's going on today in the world? I get up in the morning. I pray Fajr. I make wudu. I pray Fajr. I have my breakfast. I watch the news. When I feel full of that, I, well, after I pray, I read a little Quran, get focused, watch the news, just you know, Muhammad, peace be upon him, had scouts. It's nice to know what the other side's doing. And then I just mind my own business. I take care of my wife. I uh, putter around the house, keeping things clean. I'm starting to put my autobiography onto Facebook, chapter um, about six or seven minutes at a time. I've been wanting to publish it, but it's been a drag to do. And now that things are the way they are, I just want to get the story of my life out there so people can see it. So it's on Facebook, little by little. It's coming out little by little. And um, stay, just asking a lot to keep me close and to take care of my, the, you know, to just to... I've been looking at this whole thing since I was 14, Eddie. When they invented the term conspiracy theory, I was 14 and Kennedy had just been killed. And they, they, they threw shade on anybody who was trying to find the truth. And that's when the term conspiracy theory started. And I got to tell you, the events of the last week or so, a whole bunch of strands, a whole bunch of pearls fell off the strand this week. And I'm just biding my time and being patient and watching things unfold and asking Allah to keep me in his, in his circle and close to him and in peace inside. I'm not afraid of anything going on in this world. My eyes, I'm on a journey. We're all, you know, we're all on a journey. This is this is not the main event. This is, you know, we're we're going somewhere, and uh, this is part of the journey. You gave so, you gave a list of things you you do. Wake up in the morning, you pray uh, pray Fajr, and then you go on. You read uh, the verbatim Word of God Almighty in its original, the Quran, and spend some time with the family. So it's business as usual. I don't go out hardly at all. Um, you know, my body is 71 years old and I have some medical issues, so I'm considered high risk. Anything happened to me, the, the odds are it would kill me. But I read, I hear about these veterans, 100-year-old veterans coming out of the hospital cured. You know, it's like, I don't believe there's anybody who's got a death sentence on them until they stop breathing. So, uh, but I have been, I haven't been uh, playing in traffic. You know, I've been staying inside. I got to tell you, the masjids around here, there's three masjids in this area. And as I said, I'm 71 and I've got some issues. My wife has some medical issues. And I got to tell you, the spirit of Islam in the Muslim communities here is, is better, is worth more than gold. It's worth more than gold. They're, it's like, it's like these people, it's, it's just like, I've been Muslim 10 years and I feel like I'm being taken care of like I'm everybody's grandfather, not just my own kids. Mm -hmm. And it's just so wonderful. It's such a blessing. It's such a blessing. It's an ego. It's an ego death to get over receiving the kind of help that I need right now. But this is part of the journey too. You know, what does it say? Muhammad, peace be upon him, said the hand that gives is better than the hand that receives, or something like that. But he didn't say it's bad to receive. He said giving's better. Okay. Receiving is good too when yeah. you need it. And I've been on both sides of that. So Allah's put me on the other side of the table for a little while, and um, I'm learning to be humble more you know the old male ego wants to go i can do this myself no you can't 
Mm -hmm. You can't even take a breath. Now, we had you on the program before, and we had your whole kind of uh, highlights of your story. For those people that uh, didn't get a chance to watch that, kind of bring us, bring us up to speed. You were, you were around 13, 14 years old, if I remember. You had your bar mitzvah. Yeah. You came from a Jewish, yeah. Jew, Jewish family. And then you, yeah. just said, you said you accepted um, uh, this beautiful way of life, the way of life of Jesus, Moses, Abraham, the last and final messenger sent to mankind, Prophet Muhammad, peace be, be upon them all, the submission and surrender to the one and only one creator of the heavens and the earth, the one they submitted to, and that's simply yes. in one word, Islam. You had slept, accepted this way of life of all the prophets and messengers around 10 years ago. Just kind of, a, yes. uh, some high, uh, just uh, kind of recapping, what was it and why, what was it that did it for you that had you accept this beautiful way of life? Okay, I'll try to be brief. Well, like I said, when I was 14, I got initiated onto the path of truth because we all know that they were they were zooming us with this one shooter story, the same way they're zooming us now with the two planes taking down the World Trade Center. Uh, so I've been following false flags and phony headlines since I was 14. That's 56, 57 years ago now. And one thing led to another, and I studied and I learned about Kennedy and then I learned about Vietnam. I was in college and I'll try to I'll try to be, try to encapsulate this. I went from one false flag to another and looked behind the scenes and saw what there was something going on, but I couldn't put it all together. When 9-11 happened, I, I, it was just physically impossible for Muslims to pull this off and the sophistication and everything and the nature of the demolition and the, the level of the violence. They couldn't have done it. It was impossible. And yet, just like the, the Nazis used to say, if you want to, to believe a lie, make it a big one. So they made it a huge lie, and so many people still believe it. And, well, I learned that the Muslims didn't do it. I, you're, talking I about not, you're talking about 9-11? 9-11. They just couldn't have done it. It was physically and physiologically and chemically and biologically. It was impossible on every level. And yet people ate it. Uh, um I was defending the Muslims, saying they couldn't have done it. And my friends, I wasn't Muslim yet. And my friends would say, why do you defend Muslims, man? I say, I'm not defending the Muslims, man. I'm defending the truth. It's, they couldn't have done it. It's like I was being objective. I wasn't being like uh, my side versus your side. It was like I was. my side is the truth. I've been like jumping fences since I was 14 looking for the truth. I wasn't going to let some man-made barrier stop me now, you know? So... After 10 years of defending Muslims and talking about 9-11 and making people try to think about it, um, I, had, I had a moment. Uh, my son called me. I was in Arkansas, in the Ozarks. I had a little hemp store selling hemp clothing and stuff. And um, it wasn't a head shop or anything like that. It was selling hemp products, you know, clothing and, for, you know, and paper and stuff. Anyway, um, he, he basically he gave me dawah. And um, he told me, he said he, he knew I'd been looking all my life. He watched me when he was growing up. And he said, uh, he gave me he gave me dawah. And he invited me and he told me. And uh, he told me where to look in the, in the Torah and the Bible and the gospel, certain quotes. And I said, I would think about it. I would look at it. And basically, I was afraid for him. I thought he was a terrorist or something because I didn't know anything. I was blind about Islam. Except I knew they couldn't have done this one thing at 9-11. I didn't know any Muslims. And one night after my son invited me, I had a moment. A couple of things happened. One, one was there was a noise so loud, I thought my house was falling down around me that an airplane had crashed into our house. And I opened my eyes and there were crickets. It was totally silent, totally silent. And I went back to sleep and I had a dream and I saw a man and I couldn't see his face, but I could tell he was smiling at me. And I described him to my first imam, and he said, Muhammad visited you. You got to see Muhammad. He was, it was a, he was, had a gold turban, or like a gold colored turban and a gold shawl. And he was dressed in white, and he was smiling. And there was light all around him, and I couldn't see his face. And it was right, and my rib cage opened up like a trench doors, and, and I felt like I was exploding inside, and all, it all came together. The words in the books I was looking at were standing on little pillars of, fire it was like the words that i was looking at that my son told me to read like in deuteronomy and in john 16 and in isaiah and different places it just like popped out 3d at me and it was like yes it was like yes and i just felt like i was home i felt like i the search was the search was over at one level and then 
the search was beginning on another level to learn my dean. Now to spend my the rest of my life learning what this is. So, but um, so you had a dream. Was, you had you you actually had a dream of 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 the last and final message of Prophet Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him. You had a dream of him. The night that I experienced the this was true. What my son had told me. I had a dream, and I and I I, I saw and I saw a being in front of me sitting smiling i couldn't see his face but i felt a huge smile on me i don't know how to describe it all i saw was like a, a you know a turban and sun and and a, and a, a you know a shawl and just a bee just like and i felt a huge smile but i couldn't see his face but i felt this huge gigantic smile on me and um i told my first imam about it and he told me he said he said you got to see muhammad so anyway that's not what convinced me I was convinced before I saw him. I was convinced not having seen him. Seeing him didn't convince me. I got to make that clear. The, everything that had led me to the point where my son invited me and I had that epiphany, that's a Christian word, but it's its like a, on, like a realization, spiritual realization. Um, I just felt, it, I don't know. I felt it, it was like a law. I don't know how to describe it. You say a law revealed it to me. You sound like you're some kind of a, you know, you're on some God trip. So I don't want to say, but he did, but he did. He did reveal it to me that this is true because you can be standing in front of the pr truth and not see it unless he lets you see it. You know, this is something I'm learning is because I asked myself, how come I can't explain this objectively to people who are smarter than me? And it's not my fault. And I'm thinking there's something wrong with me. And it's not. Allah puts a cover over people's eyes for whatever reason. Something's in their heart. It's not their time to hear it yet. I don't know why. I'm not judging them. I'm just saying it's not up to me that people get the message. That's not my job. My job is to be the try to be the best person I can be. Convey the message with the best manners I can convey. Don't get into mud slinging on social networks. Stay elegant. Remember the prophet with the blood in his shoes getting stoned at and not not don't get into name calling and all that terrible stuff that's a sin. Try to stay elegant. Remember who we represent. We represent the most high God. We represent Allah. We represent we're, we're inviting people to come to Allah. We don't have to stoop to these low levels of communication that exist on social networks. When you're there's a lot of people that are sincere and want to hear this. So I advise myself sometimes i get caught we all do and i advise everyone listening don't get caught in the in mudslinging or ca verbal cage fighting i call it Ver verbal Stay i free. like that one verbal cage fighting <laughs> yeah you're a you're a you're a mix you're a martial artist aren't you yeah 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 i always i tell people i tell people i don't do verbal cage fighting i like Sorry. that <laughs> yeah you feel free <laughs> it's in the public domain yeah you look i i've been watching you too eddie you inspire me mashallah you inspire me you know uh, so anyway, um, go ahead. So, sure, so, sure. so now, um, it wasn't, so you had something that's amazing. I mean, to, 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 um, be able to have this dream of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, but you said it wasn't, you were convinced of Islam before that. Was it, was it the authenticity of the Quran? Was it the simple theology of worshiping the creator alone, not the creation doing, being, being morally upright? Was it the, uh, was it the consistency with the, the chain of revelation coming from being able to put it in a chronological order that it wasn't confusing. Like many people get confused mm -hmm. with the man-made okay. religions. All right. I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I'm going to answer you as simply as I can. I'm going to answer you the same way I, I answer, you know, I say this, you know, there's only one cause of death. There's only one cause of death. Allah took you. There's certain, the rest is details. You know, car accident, die in your sleep, coronavirus, whatever. These are not the cause of death. The cause of death is the law decided that you go now. So by the same token, what I'm saying to you is that I could have known, I could have been studying all this all my life. I could have been, I could have had it down. I could have known every chapter and verse and I, could, and I wouldn't have seen it. I could have been a drunk in a, in a gutter. And if Allah wanted to show me this, he would have showed it to me. I can't take any credit for anything. I can't explain this. I, I, was diligently with eyes open seeking the truth but i had no idea what it would be and when i when it did hit me in that nanosecond like uh, you know the palm slap in the between the eyes that islam is true it was like that was the last thing in the world i would have thought it was the last 
and I had I was laughing and crying at the same time. And I just want to say that crying that night that I had that realization, the tears weren't rolling down my face, Eddie. The tears were flying out of my eyes like birds. I was watching them. I was watching the tears fly out of my face. They were a trajectory. They were going out of me. I never saw such a thing in my I felt like I was in a Disney movie. I was looking at the tears flying out of my and I wasn't tripping or uh, no artificial, you know, stimulus or anything like that. It, it was coming out of the tears were flying out of my face. And I, I you know, it's just I it was just overwhelming. He he humbled me to a point. I had a dream shortly after that that I was like just floating out in space and I was getting thrown every which way and I had no ground beneath me and no heaven above me and I was just being thrown around and I didn't know where I was and it was very scary. And then all of a sudden I said Allah and all of a sudden it was like snap. And I just feel like either he was testing me or Shaitan was messing with me or something because it was just feeling like you were falling out of an airplane or something. And, yeah. uh, and then all of a sudden I just, I called out to Allah and everything, everything was mellow. It was just, and never, that didn't happen again. But it's just in the everyday life, the, the, you asked me this question, like what turned me? It was a combination of things. I can't, it's like you eat a meal and it's got all these ingredients in it. And somebody says, and the chef says, what did you like about it the best? It was like, what did you like? The salt, the pepper, the spices, the cayenne, the turmeric the no it was the combination it was the whole thing yeah it's it's like Allah revealed it to me that's all I got he gets all the credit he gets all the glory you know I could have been studying this all my life or I could have been out chasing women or drinking or partying or what if he wanted me he would have got me yeah so you know or I could have been a monk and I was you know so I was that too so in my search so he, I just feel so blessed and saved from what could have happened to me Mm -hmm. When yeah. I was 13, I was bar mitzvahed. I was Jewish, and it was a Jewish family born into. And my parents gave me a choice. They said, you want to have a party or go to Israel and have a visit? And I said, I want to have a party. And I've seen a lot of my generation turn into, like, really monstrous people who are, like, they go over to Israel, they get some land, and they start shooting up Palestinians like they own the place. And uh, that could have been me. Easy could have been me. My parents didn't know the the secret agenda going on over there. They were good. They didn't know the, the horrific things going on there. They were, they were most American Jews don't have a clue what's happening over there. They don't know the, the hidden agenda of the Zionist movement and what it's got to do with the antichrist and the false Messiah coming and the one world government. Most Amer most American Jews, they think it's like to help the poor Jews from world war two, but it's not. Anyway, I don't want to get into political, you know, I said enough about that, Yeah, but that when I look when I look at where I am now and I look at where I could have been, I just it's like being having been in the ocean surrounded by sharks and somebody threw you a rope. I'm telling you, I, I you know, you know about the uh, the Jewish scholars during the time of Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, who also they also when they were looking, they were looking for the signs. The Jews, yeah. the Jews were there for a reason. Right. In Medina, they were waiting for the place of dates, the place of dates. Tell yes. us about that and tell us about those scholars also who are sincere, who are humble, like yourself, who are, who are true seekers. They didn't let nothing stop them from accepting after they verified in their own books the Torah, after they lo looked at Prophet Muhammad and they observed him and they tested him, that they confirmed that he's the final messenger sent by the creator of the heavens and earth. Yes, there's one, there's one in particular I know the story of. Forgive me, if I look a little green, it's because I have one of these banker lamps. It's got a green glass shade. <laughs> so I look a little, <laughs> I got a green cast on me and I'm not sick or anything. Yeah. I'm just a little green here. Um, there, was a, there was a rabbi. His name was um, Hossein, Hossein uh, bin uh, Salem. And he was a rabbi during the time of Muhammad, peace be upon him. And he was waiting for the prophet that was foretold to come to the place of dates. And he heard about Muhammad. And this man was a Torah scholar and he was uh, well respected and all his, his congregation thought he was like the greatest rabbi, you know, ever. So um, just trying to get, sorry, I'm just trying to get comfortable here. All right. Am I still with you? You're still there? Good. It's good. Yeah. So, um, so, 
he knew he knew you know he was like he was like a student a seeker of truth he wasn't gonna let a fence or a barrier stop him so he heard about muhammad he went to see muhammad peace be upon him and he asked him the there are certain questions that rabbis have to to, to discern a prophet um and he asked the rabbi these questions i don't know them all one of them has to do with who did you come for uh, came for the poor, not the rich, and so forth. I don't know all the questions, but he asked him three or four questions. Muhammad, peace be upon him, answered all the questions perfectly, of course. And um, Hossein, Rabbi Hossein Ibn uh, Salam said, "I want to. I, I, there's no deity worthy of worship, and you're the prophet." He became Muslim right there. So, so Prophet Muhammad said to him, "Let's go. What about your people? What about your congregation?" And he said. Uh, he said, because Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, they've been giving me a lot of grief, your congregation, you know. So he said, what are we going to do? Let's, let's, so they set up, a, they set up a, a situation. They set up a scenario. So anyway, Muhammad, peace be upon him, gave Hossein ibn Salam a new name, Abdullah ibn Salam, okay? Slave of Allah, servant of Allah. Okay, so he gave him the name Abdullah ibn Salam, became a close companion, and he told him to stay in the tent, stay in his tent. And then he got one of his Sahaba to call all the Jews over to his tent to stand outside. He was going to talk to them. So he talked to them. He, he They all came around, and he said to them, uh, who do you say this um, Hossein ibn Salam is? What kind of a rabbi? Who is he? And the Jews are all going, he's a wonderful man. He's the greatest rabbi since sliced bread and... You know, they just loved him. He's smart. He knows the Torah like the back of his hand. He's the greatest guy. Okay. So then Muhammad said, I don't know the exact piece be upon him. I don't know if he came brought out the rabbi, you know, or if he wasn't a rabbi anymore. He was a companion. He was still a teacher. But he came out. And anyway, after they found out he was a, the bottom line is when they found out he became a Muslim and that he, you know, recognized the prophet. They all started cursing him out, saying he was a dog and he was a bad guy and he was, didn't know nothing. He was a worthless and, you know, piece of dirt. So that's how it goes. That's how it goes. There's a brother, there's an imam or a brother, a scholar in England, Abdul Rahman Green, the big tall guy, red hair. You know who I'm talking about, right? Abdul Rahim Green? Yeah. You know him, right? Yes, yes. He tells a story about he's got a friend who's a rabbi and he says to the rabbi, one day they got friends. He says, Rabbi, you know Muhammad's real, right? He goes, Rabbi goes, Yeah, I know the rabbi. I, I know Muhammad's true. He says, So why don't you tell your congregation? And the rabbi said, If they don't follow their own prophet, what makes you think they're gonna follow anybody else's prophet? Wow, yeah. Yeah. This was a rabbi talking. He's got they got tough jobs. They're very wayward, stiff necked people, you know. So what are you gonna do? Uh -huh. May Allah guide them all. Uh, May Allah guide them all. I mean, there's this word you used. You you said that th w this was created. You said earlier, this is something that you've gone down uh, a lot of these, uh, what we'd call rabbit holes, would you call them? Yes. And uh, there's a term you call you, you you said that was coined for what reason? Conspiracy theorists? What is that? Conspiracy theory. Um, when, when people started poking around the Kennedy assassination to to try to f figure out what really happened, the CIA coined that term and put it out into the public, into the society. And they have something, they're called slides. You know how you put a slide into a slide projector and it projects an image on a screen? They have, I, they have, I think they might've scrubbed this information from the computer because I can't find it anymore, but they have these things called slides, which are trigger words and things like that, that automatically change a person's brain and make them think in a different direction like conspiracy theory it automatically throws shade it throws doubt it's kind of like an, uh, the zionist game book the zionist playbook 101 question the mental capacity of the opponent they all say oh you're crazy and you're this and you're that sigmund freud who was you know big in with the with the tavistock institute and the zionists and so forth he was like the power of, of the guys who had the the psychiatry and the psychology degrees, they could they could destroy a person just by saying something about them. The person didn't even have to be guilty. All he had to do was say that person's crazy or that person's out of their mind. And if you get into an, uh, any kind of a debate with a, a hardcore Zionist, the first thing they're going to do just about is attack your mental state. 
they're going to call they're going to call into question your mental state and this is just what they do this is what they do so you you don't go near that anymore once you know you're dealing with somebody like that you cut bait you go fish somewhere else <laughs> this is what i used to tangle with people like this and waste so much energy and i found out it was a sin i thought i was trying to like do something good yeah no so th no. this is so this is a stigma that's attached to now obviously there's there's people who delight in this and there's some things that are far-fetched and way out there but there might be something out there that because we know the mainstream media ha has known to lie there's you know for instance we can give some examples like you just gave one that the majority of the world is convinced about but let, let's yeah. go let, let's go to something that's not even the, the um we'll get to that one in a second but let's let's something that's just been proven fact and maybe you can add to these uh weapons okay, i'm just trying to get myself so right, I, I, we, we I, you probably know much more of these, but let me start off with a few. You have weapons of mass destruction. Uh, now, this was something that was perpetuated. The media pushed it. They had brought down their experts, everybody. The whole world was fooled. And then yeah. at the end, it was turned out that it was a lie. Yes. So yes. That, that's one example. You have the babies in incubators. You remember that one? They took the babies out of the incubators. took the incubators and left the children to die on the cold floor. The U.S. public is outraged. The result? Support for land war zooms. It's a turning point. Desert Storm is launched. 135,000 Iraqis are killed. An estimated one million Iraqis, many of them children and old people, then die as a result of 10 years of sanctions. One small problem. There never were any incubator baby deaths, not one. The Canadian Broadcasting Corporation's investigative flagship program, The Fifth Estate, reveals the girl to be the Kuwaiti ambassador's daughter, given her lines and coached in acting by the giant American PR firm Hill & Knowlton. It's one phase in a $10 million joint U.S.-Kuwaiti campaign of deception. This man is lying. I, myself, buried 14 newborn babies that had been taken from their incubators. This man is lying. And they had kids in incubators, and they were thrown out of the incubators so that Kuwait could be systematically dismantled. There were a lot of people who participated in a conspiracy, yes, an out-and-out -out conspiracy, of fake organizations, false documents, fraud, and disinformation. That's when they had the woman coming on crying that they were um, killing babies in the incubators. And then later that was also came out as, as a lie. Uh, the, the false pretense of invading many of these countries, Afghanistan and whatnot, these were based on just lies. Uh, sure. The Gulf of Tonkin, for instance, you know that one? That was a false flag. Yeah, that's clear. That's nothing that that's it just came out now. Robert, the, the, the Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, on his deathbed, confessed because he didn't want to go to his grave with that on his brain on his on his soul yeah that he he admitted it was a false flag before he died and this guy was the secretary of defense during the vietnam war a big part of it and he admitted it he admitted it so yeah well the government had, so what if they, they admit it but they still do what they do the government was found guilty of of assassinating martin luther king too on a civil court, nobody knows this, or very few people know it. It's like, there, there's a huge juggernaut happening between, it's a big battle between good and evil. You know it and I know it. We're coming down to the wire, the last days, the end times, the time before the hour. So, you know, people are complaining about Trump, but he's fulfilling a prophecy. You know, when the Bedouin came to the prophet and said, when is honesty gonna, you know, when is the hour? You know that one, right? The Bedouin said, when's the hour? And the prophet, peace be upon him, said, when honesty is lost. And the Bedouin said, well, prophet, Allah's messenger, how can honesty be lost? He says, when there's unfit leaders. And I think that Trump is becoming such a graphic example of this. It's like, I feel like Allah's just going, look, look, can you, can you see this? Can you see how unfit this is? You know, I mean... It doesn't get a whole lot more unfit. But again, may Allah guide him too. May Allah I mean, guide him. I'd love it if he woke up tomorrow morning and said, I had a 
I had a dream like like I had. Yeah. You know, but I don't know if that's going to so, happen. But t- I, tell us. Uh, so now, if someone comes along and questions the official narrative, are, were you saying that now this term you, there's holes in the story and there in the, in the theory? So if you question that, it, it, whatever is pushed out by mainstream media, if you question that, then this was developed. This term was coined to stigmatize you and to label you with that? You can lose your job. You can lose your family. You can lose your social position. You can lose your your key to the bathroom, the executive bathroom. You can lose your your um, freedom. They could, they could, they could, you know, they could uh, figure out some, some charges against you if they wanted to that, you know, w- w- what we're coming up to now is they want to make it against the law to, to criticize the coronavirus uh, pro- policies. They want to make it against the law to criticize Israel. They want to take away our freedom of speech. We can criticize our own government, but they want to make it illegal for us to criticize what's going on in, in uh, the occupied land of the Zionists sort of occupying right now we're not we could be punished for talking about it I mean again I don't want to get too excited about all the detail because this is just another rung in the ladder it's just another step in in the process of what's going on that's all so are you so you mentioned so I asked you because you mentioned that term and then you mentioned 9-11 because a lot of this was a catalyst from the 9-11, all of these wars and, and yeah. all of the other civil liberties being taken away. So now, if you question if there's, which there are, I mean, thousands of architects and engineers, there, there are so right. many people, intellectuals, academics, Christian professors, you know, who right. are coming out and they're questioning the official story. So are, are all of them conspiracy theorists? And are, are you 100%, not 99, but 100% convinced that, it's, that Muslims had nothing to do with Building 7 coming down? What I'm going to say is this. Who took down the, the towers and who pulled off the, all the tragedies on 9-11 were a combination of people consisting of people from different countries, people with different political leanings, and I'm... and. There may, I'm, I wouldn't put it, I believe there were some Muslims involved, but they by no means masterminded this. By no means were they the ones who, who pulled this off and masterminded it. They may have been players, but I don't believe, I don't believe at all that they were in any control of the operation at all. Do you think they that, were, do you think yeah. that Islam and Muslims were used as a scapegoat? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because the powers that be, it's, it, it's a very simple connecting the dots. The powers that be are trying to hijack the planet, depopulate the humanity, dumb us down with, with chemicals and, and diseases and, and uh, vaccinations and foods and stuff like that, and pretty much turn this world into their private country club. And um, it's not going to happen because this is the, this is the gospel of the godless. This is their dream of the future, okay? God has other plans, and his, he's the best planner, and his plan is going to prevail. Now, I have to ask you, Eddie, am I wandering, am I digressing, or am I, am I answering your question? No, you're answering. That's what, uh, my, yeah, my question was, do you, um, do you believe that Muslims uh, were, and Islam was used as a scapegoat? You answered it, yes. I believe Islam was used as a scapegoat, yes. I believe that there may have been some Muslims involved in pulling this off. Yes. But um, do I believe that they were like the 19 hijackers and all that stuff? I don't believe it happened like they said at all. I believe, no, none of that. There were direct energy weapons. The play, the thing was vaporized. The buildings were vaporized. It was like a space weapon. It was like direct energy weapons were used. Demolition was used. They even said there was a, on the Richter scale, there was a 2.6 tremor under the World Trade Center before the planes arrived. You can check me out. There was a, tre- there was a small nuclear explosion or high, high intensity explosion under the, everybody's talking about it. All the firemen, all the first responders, the blew out, the bottom of the place blew out. There are, there are beams in the basement that are cut with an with a electric saw. You can see it. But nobody is like that. 
nobody's talking pay no attention to the you know pay no attention to the everybody is afraid to what like when kennedy got shot i was 14 i'm walking around go how come nobody's talking about this how come nobody's questioning it and i think that the general mood was hey if they're going to blow off the head of the president of the united states in broad daylight on television i'm not going to make any peeps i'm not going to make a sound you know and that's what i think was the general and a few brave people stood up and a few brave people stood up and a lot of people that actually were eyewitnesses on 9 11 they're dead people who were working for the city there were even there were from call from prostitutes to city managers people who were privy to information from hearing stories or being a witness to somebody talking about something and doing something and so many of them died it's on youtube you go and you see yeah. the testimony of these people the people who actually saw the airplane they said i i personally believe that there were no airplanes there that's my personal belief my personal belief is these were 3d holograms um and because they found a jet on the street they said it was from the crash it doesn't match any of the planes that um apparently hit the hit the world trade center and when you watch these videos the wings disappear and appear this thing was cgi and this was done with direct energy weapons de controlled demolition am i di am i going too far off the beam here there were israeli artists quote unquote artists inside the world trade center for months before it went down apparently to create some kind of art project I believe in my heart of hearts, they were wiring the place. They were wiring the place. And you can see from the slow motion videos where these little pops are coming out. It's like a controlled demolition. There's no question. And then you said building seven, you mentioned building seven and it just fell at the end of the day. Um, what's the, what's the, what's the uh, logic behind that? That one, one, one thing is that it's, you know, when you get into some of these things with the uh, oh, CGI yeah, yeah, and all yeah. this stuff, for many people it can be very overwhelming. But when you see a a building just come down like a controlled demolition, I mean that's yeah. some, something that's easy to to look at and to decipher that hold on and to see no there was no plane that actually hit that building. So that's where many of the right. architects and engineers right. are looking at that well, and they're like, hold on, and the com controlled de demolition experts. And that's where people are really questioning because this is right in front of their eyes. They're seeing it. There was a lot of very sensitive information in the World Trade Center. And there was also a whole lot of gold belonging to various countries in vaults underneath the World Trade Center that nobody seems to be able to find right now. Um, there, were, there were CIA um, offices. There were places that, um, there were records in that, in that complex that they needed to they needed to too big to shred okay too much to shred so they did it that way it was too much to shred now why did they do it why did they take it down you know i had a friend i have a friend and he and i used to deliver vegetarian food organic food in new jersey and i we used to kid around in the 90s and say wouldn't it be cool if you could lay the world trade center down sideways turn it into a hothouse think of all the food you could grow and i just thought to myself if this thing had been hit by an airplane and it was going to fall it would have it, it wouldn't have turned into dust period end of story um uh <laughs> i'm not i'm not laughing from laughing i'm laughing from it's nervous it's a it's a nervous you know it's not funny yeah so yeah, I just uh, I brought these questions up because you mentioned the 9/11, and a lot of times uh, people to this day they will question Muslims. Uh, it'll be in the back of their head, you know. Those people, it's always associated. There's always a stigma, and every time September 11 nines around, it's always never forget. So do you do you believe? What do you think? Should should Muslims continue um, to go with the not all, but some who would still continue to go with the official story? Or should Muslims start standing out and saying, stop, never forget that Islam and Muslims had nothing to do with 9-11 and stop using us as the scapegoat? Well, when I first became Muslim, I was on a roll talking about it all the time. Just because I was into the truth, which I still am. And it wasn't about being into being Muslim. It was into being in the truth. And that's what led me. That's the beauty of my journey. 
I was looking for the truth. I wasn't looking for anything else. And I didn't care what it made me look like or where it took me. And where it took me, I had to trust. Because if I knew where I was going, I wouldn't be on a search, would I? So I didn't know what I was going to find. So I had to trust. Um, Surat al-Bakura. I don't know. I'm not a scholar. I don't know the exact quote. But it says something in there like, you could talk yourself blue in the face and these, some of these people are never going to believe you. They're never going to hear you. I put something over their heart or over their mind or over their eyes and they're not going to see it. They're not going to see it. So don't waste your time. Mm -hmm. So I used to, but then in other places in the Quran, it says strive and argue and with the best manners and, and go at these people and sometimes even be harsh. And, and so there's like a, you've got to understand the meanings and the context and stuff. And I'm learning more about it. But what I'm seeing is when I get into a, a dialogue with somebody, if I sense that they're a closed mind, it's kind of like, you know, the guidance prayer, the guy, how do you know if what God's saying, what Allah is saying when you pray the guidance prayer? My imam said, if your heart, if it feels like your rib cage is opening and you feel loose and good, it's a yes. And if you feel all tight, it's a no. Well, it's the same, same thing with, I believe with given dawah with people. I'm, I'm going with the same feelings. If I'm talking to somebody and they're, and they're listening to me, they don't have to agree with everything I'm saying, but if I'm talking to a, an open mind, an objective open mind that's willing to connect and, and communicate on a on a on a level playing field and res mutual respect and talking about the information and no attacking the people then you go and if somebody starts attacking you you know you're in the wrong ballpark you're in the you're right you know you're in the wrong place you dust your you know Jesus gave directions to his to his companions when he sent them out he said you go you you knock on the door, you, you, you say salam alaikum, you, 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 you make the dawah, you, give, you invite them to monotheism. And if they don't like you, you dust off your feet and you keep going. Mm -hmm. You don't stand there and argue with them or try to convince yeah. them or try to close them. And even Muhammad used to stress on this, peace be upon him, he used to anguish over this. And Muhammad and Allah said, you're, you're, what are you, you're going to kill yourself over this? He says, you're their warner, you're not their guardian. And the same goes for us. And I know how it feels. You have a big heart. Look at what you're doing with your life. You're putting it out there for everybody. And you're trying to, all you're doing, you're just like trying to just share with people the best you have. And it's like, don't waste your time. Jesus also said, peace be upon him, don't cast pearls before swine. And I don't mean people are swine, but sometimes the mind is swine-like, meaning mm -hmm. that it could take something valuable and trash it. Yeah. That, uh, so that when someone... No, go yeah. ahead. Finish. Go ahead. When someone go ahead. That's a, so I was going to say, I'm learning to discern more who I should spend time with uh, sharing information and who to just say peace to and walk away. Yes. Yeah, that was uh, that ayah that was uh, in Surah Baqarah, the uh, ayah six. Inna in kafaru sawa'un alayhim an dartahum am lam tundirhum la hum la yu'minu. Yeah, as to those who reject faith, it is the same whether you warn them or warn them not, they will not believe. And Allah, the Creator, had set a seal on their hearts and on their hearing and on their eyes is a veil. Great is the penalty they incur. So this is the, the verse that you were referring to. Yeah, and it's like I'm not cursing them and I'm not judging them. I'm just saying, hey, if you knock on a door and the door opens and says somebody says, come in, you go in. But if you knock on the door and the door doesn't open and people are cursing at you through the door, you should turn around and walk away. It's yeah. real simple. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> that's all. So now with this whole um, global pandemic that's going on, uh, you said you have it's business as usual for you. Uh, you're um, staying home. You're doing what you normally do, but you mentioned some 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 um, some some things that behind the scene that um, that were potentially happening that many of the 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 people are uh, unaware of. Like, what what are some of these things that that you feel from your research uh, are things that are kind of do you feel going on behind the scenes while the, okay yeah. I get you. I'm not, I don't know the future. I'm not a fortune teller and may Allah forbid me from ever pretending to be, or even assuming to be, or, or, um, anything like that. But it says in the Quran somewhere, Allah does give some people insight and 
there's a way to be something like a messenger and a prophet, but not be a messenger and a prophet. And again, I don't know the chapter and verse, but I know it's there. I don't know the exact, but so I'm, I don't feel special, better, holier than thou, any of that. But I just feel like Allah gave me a gift. Okay. And the gift, you know, those fisheye lenses that sometimes objects appear closer to yeah. you than they are. I feel like he put one in my brain. Okay. So I'm just going to say a few things, but inshallah, I don't know if this is going to happen or not. These are just things I see on the horizon. Is this from, okay? is this from you going down these, uh, investigating, yes. researching? From, from, yes. Yes. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. No. A little bit of a delay here. Yeah. Okay. Number one. I believe that the coronavirus is another false flag, even more horrific than 9-11. It's already killed way more people um, than happened on 9-11. Um, Bill Gates owns a factory in Wuhan, China that manufactures biochemistry, um, biochemical testing and stuff. He also has the patent on the coronavirus and also on the on the cure on the on the on the vaccination for it and he also is into eugenics big time he wants to uh, depopulate the planet to fight you know to like 500 million people it's like the georgia guidestone thing where to make it sustainable but this has been going on what's happening what i'm seeing happen eddie is in 3d real time things are happening that i was thinking about and reading about and dreaming about with over the last 57 years, the one world government coming closer, uh, the cashless society coming closer. If nobody's going to use cash anymore, that the, what they want to do is they want to, Bill Gates wants to chip everybody before, he wants to tag us before he lets us out. Did you hear about this one? They want to tag us. They want to put a microchip into us that will have everything on us, everything, our bank account, our social security, our insurance, our health records, everything. So if we act up, they can turn us off. There was a movie called The Net with Sandra Bullock in the 90s. It was like that. It was like a premonition of this. Um, they want to chip us. This they, A lot of people believe this is the mark of the beast, which is this chip that they want to put into, into our bodies in our, in our hand area or in our forehead area where, the, where they could just scan us. Okay. And you don't have to carry money anymore, keys, ID, nothing. It's all in there. Oh, how great this is going to be. I feel like it's, uh, and I would rather have my head cut off. Okay. Now, now, now rather... is this, now is, now is this where people is, are these like where you would say, okay, now this is, uh, cons these are conspiracy theories. Is this something that now people, uh, can go research, verify? Oh yeah. Or oh, you like... can research it. It's everywhere. The, they're already chipping dogs, pets, uh, teenagers, wayward teenagers, people in old folks' homes, people with Alzheimer's diseases. I believe the Prince of uh, what it, Prince Charles and the royal family got shipped. Um, some corporations are doing it. Uh, how much easier it's going to make it? Oh, it's becoming popular. There's a company called Verichip. I was looking at this 20 years ago. There was a company called Mondex, which was promoting the cashless society. I did see. Um, I did see on on uh, Al Jazeera. They they had an I think uh, was it Sweden or Denmark. They were showing people getting chipped and having chipping parties. Yeah, I saw they that. Think it's yes. cool. What's going to happen? So I did I see that. To the, I refer. They're in a hurry to roll this out, and these lithium batteries are going to malfunction, and a lot of people are going to. Anyway, but this is the mark. I believe this could. On this thing is a UPC code. Okay, we're we're going to be basically like commodities. We're going to be like. And we're going to be, they're going to know where we are, what we're doing. They'll be able to listen in. They'll be, have, they'll be able to mic us. They'll be able to watch us. I mean, they just want to lock down the human race and just play golf mm -hmm. or something. I don't know what they want to do, yeah. but they want to lock down. And maybe they want to have their, their uh, blood parties or whatever they do. But um, may Allah forbid it. Um, they're going to get away with it for a little while. Allah when you say they, what do you mean they, they? When you say they, who's they? Okay, um, there's a combination of people, all right? You've got, it's the one world government people. It's the new world order people. It's the ultra filthy, obscenely rich ones that, now there are probably some really, really obscenely rich people that are probably good people, but they're few and far between because in order to get that rich, you gotta sell a lot of your soul up 
you got to give up a lot for for most of the people. There's probably a few that did it their good way, but um, you're asking me what's the question? Repeat when, that. When you say they, we heard that this they, term, they. Okay, yeah. I'm talking about this, this, the trilateral. All right, if you want to put a name on some of these groups, the Trilateral Commission, the um, the the um, Council of Foreign Relations (CFR). Trilateral Commission, CFR, Bilderberg Group, uh, these groups where people, these ultra-rich people get together and party, Bohemian Grove, do all sorts of weird stuff. But they're basically planning out the, they're sitting down with a clipboard planning out the world. Is this something, are, are they, are this, is, does this have anything to do with the uh, person that, that had that island and they were bringing children on? And this yes, was uncovered. Jeffrey Epstein. Jeffrey Epstein. Jeffrey Epstein. Yeah, that that's something that was obviously that that was something that was. Um, if you were to talk about it, people would think you're making something up, conspiracy theories. But this was actually uncovered that they had an island and they were having uh, they were pedophiles on that island and they were raping and doing whatever with sex slaves with children. They're finding bones on the beach in the water. They're finding skeletons underground and stuff. Um, I believe I don't have proof. You know, intuition is a wonderful thing. You know, I I go on intuition a lot because people can make up information. And in this day and age, you can make up video. Video can be faked. Anything can be faked. I go on my intuition that Allah gave me a lot because it's guided me to him. And my intuition, it tells me, plus some news reports I read, is that this man, Jeffrey Epstein, worked for Mossad, which is Israeli Secret Service. And he had files on all the world leaders doing atrocious things to children. And he was basically blackmailing the leaders of the world. And I believe that was his mission, along with this lady who worked with him, who mysteriously got away. Um, yeah, I believe that he worked for Mossad, Israeli Secret Service, and that he his job or part of his mission was to, you know, put put uh, world leaders into compromising situations so he could control them. So his so the Zionists could control uh, the world, the rest of these people. Uh -huh. Yeah. I, I'm not. I'm not saying myself that I that I believe in in any of these things. I just don't. I don't know, and I think that I don't either. I yeah. believe it. I don't know. Yeah, uh, and but I know that we have been lied to. There are things going on that there. That's another um, pay level, another level of clearance. One might say. I, I I was the CIA director. We lied. We cheated. We steal, stole. It's, it was like we we had we had entire we had entire training courses. Uh, but there are things that are going on behind the scenes. We, we've been, so many lies have unfolded. I, I, I was the CIA director. We lied, we cheated, we steal, stole. So many things yeah. that we've been told, uh, the yeah. general public, and it's been lie after lie after lie. So if a liar comes to you with some news, the creator of the heavens and earth, Allah SWT tells us, if a faucet comes to us, go, verify, check it up. You know, so that's, as yes. Muslims, we should, I mean, we should be people who go verify, we should go check. And a lot of times you're not going to get the truth from the mainstream media. You have to go out, out elsewhere. So you, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Uh, there's a lot of credible people online, a lot of very credible people online, ex-veterans, uh, ex-people who were in the government, um, because they know they're not going to get justice in the media. So they're they're putting it out online. Yeah. And they're talking about it. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there's a woman named Catherine Austin Fitz. She was um, in the Bush administration at 9-11. She left. She's got an organization called Solari, S-O-L-A-R-I. This woman is amazing. She's, she's amazing. And uh, it would be great if you could get her as a guest. Yeah. But I, <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. And, and, and what if you get her as Catherine Austin Fitz, yes. uh, Solari Group. Um, she's very astute about these things from the inside looking out. I mean, she was on the inside and yeah. she, she became aware of what was going on. Um, the, uh... I try to maintain what I try to do Eddie, is maintain the, I try to keep my lens wide because if you narrow your lens and you start getting into one event, like the buildings, the jets, um, the virus, this, that I want to maintain, I want to keep my focus that I'm on a journey, that Allah wins, that this has all been foretold, that it's going to be worse before it gets better, that Jesus, peace be upon him, is coming back after the Antichrist has been here for a little while, and that 
I just want to see his face smiling at me again, mm -hmm. only only for real, not yeah. in my dream. Uh, not his face. I want to see Allah's face smiling at me in in paradise. And this and I'm so to do that, what I need to do is focus on trying to do all the obligatory things Allah wants me to do, which is pray and fast and, and give zakat when I can and go to Hajj when I can and make shahada and yeah. so on and so forth. You know, and this is my focus, you know, because I was a watcher all my since Kennedy, I was a watcher until I became Muslim. And Allah has been weaning me off of being a watcher of the dunya and is starting to move me more towards being a watcher of the deen. Yeah. And, and to be like, just keep an eye on the dunya. But my focus is shifting. It's been 10 years now, and I'm, I feel like I'm still watching the news. I still keep it on in the background sometimes, but I'm paying more attention to, to, what, I sh to what I should be doing as a Muslim and, and what, 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 where my brain, where my consciousness and my body and all everything needs to be as a Muslim, yeah. uh, uh, you know, the, traveling in this world. Um, what, what, um, what I get from this is that it actually increases my iman, my faith, because when we say they, I asked you about they, Allah also says in the Quran, they plot and plan. And Allah plans and Allah is the best of planners. So if we believe in Allah, we believe in our, the enemy, the he of truth, the satanic forces, Iblis. Yeah. So I think that um, I heard a, 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 a nice statement, a brilliant statement where the person was talking about that we, uh, glo most of us have secularized shaitan. And what happens is that we don't look that many in these organizations watch like shaitan's hands in some of these organ big organizations. So now, when you have someone who's obviously, let's say a doctor, let's say he's a person that's running a WHO or running CDC, and let's say for just for argument's sake, let's say, or in his example, if the person has taqwa, if the person is living for Allah, for the hereafter, yes. if, if yeah. then you see that this person is morally upright, this person is sound, but when you have, right. when you have someone who's far away from Allah, when people who worship money and who are involved in these, in these um, secret movements and, and also sell their souls, you just don't know what to expect and you don't know what can be happening behind the scene. But this, uh, for myself, it, it increases my mind knowing that, you know, when some, a lot of these things uncover that, you know, there are sick people out there. There are people who have submitted themselves to the shaitan who worship money, power, fame, and 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 their their lost souls. They need Islam more than ever because this is the ones that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala talks about who are spreading. You know, they say they're spreading peace, but they're the ones who are actually spreading mischief all over the world. Yeah. Yes, yes. So, I find peace in knowing, believing with certainty that I'm on the right track and I'm on the straight path. I, I encourage good and I forbid evil whenever I can. I try to avoid, as I say, verbal cage fighting. Yeah. Try to keep my body healthy. Try to take care of my wife and and my and my family. Help as I can, um, and whatever limited help I can give. And um, watch watch the watch it go by. Watch the world go by because because I, this is all. It's gonna this. Everybody's screaming about Trump. Trump's a Trump's a sideshow. Trump's a opening act. It's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. And I know this is true because Allah said so. And um, you know, I just want to. It's like you know the sprint versus the cross country. You got to yeah. pace yourself. Yeah. We're in a long run here. We're in a long run. We got to pace ourselves, and we don't want to burn out. To, you know, sprint go sprinting off on a on a. You know, get lost in one of these, one of these, one of these, uh, one of these. What do they call them now uh, on TV when they drop something for you to go? It's like when you play with a ball of yarn and a kitty cat. They, oh. they, I forgot what they call it, talking points or something. Uh, they just throw something out into the into the media, so people will be distracted while they're doing this other thing over here on this other thing. Uh -huh. The three card Monty. You know, watch. Don't watch my hands. You know. Yeah. Um, so to stay focused that the fact that we're living in a world that's about to go through some the most major change it's ever gone through and that and that Allah is going to is going to make everything right and um and that death is not the end of the road nor is it a punishment this is a very important thing to instill in all in all of us is to remember 
that death is not the end of the road, nor is it a punishment. Everybody tastes death. So this is not what we, we shouldn't be afraid of dying. And if you, and if you put, and if you, and you know, we all know that, you know, a lot of people think, you know, being a martyr is a, a Muslim martyr is like some guy who blows people up. And we know that a terrorist goes to the hellfire. We know that Allah hates terrorism and forbids terrorism. It's a big lie. It's a big sin. So, that way I just want to stay on the street and um, do what I can to help on the way everybody along the way who I meet to try to help people point them in the right direction what I believe to be the right and uh, so grateful so, you know this is so Eddie we're alive at the most incredible time in human history it just blows me away and I, I sometimes I feel like Allah, I can't take this. this is going to be too. And then Allah says, "No, I never think this you can't handle." So any anybody that's on Earth right now is going to be going through a lot. And I just ask Allah to make it easy, as easy as possible for everyone, especially ones who who love Him and who obey Him. I was you were cutting out there. Can you hear me? Yeah. Did you hear that? last yeah. part say it again it was, it was breaking up i just ask a lot to, to guide everyone especially or guide them to, you know when i first became muslim you know i was told you know you you can pray for non-muslims one thing only you can pray for them to be guided for for muslims you can pray for all kinds of stuff but any non-Muslim, the only thing can make, I was told by my imam, who said you can pray for them to be guided. Yes, yes. Right, guided. So, so, so this is what I pray. I pray that the Muslims be guided closer to Allah and the non-Muslims be guided to the threshold. Amen. And, um, and, 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 you know, Rome, Roman Empire fell, Ad fell, Atlantis fell, all these different civilizations that were way ahead of us technologically, they forgot Allah, and they they're underwater or they're underground. Yeah. And and um, you know, the Hopi Nation, who uh, they're monotheistic, although they have spirits and all this, but they do believe that the Ameri they, they said that they have a prophecy. They're going to watch the United States come, and they're going to watch the United States go. And um, I'm not worried about that either. I got a good friend in Malaysia. I'm gonna. No, I'm just kidding. Mm. No, I don't know. It doesn't matter where you are physically. Mm. It really doesn't matter where you are physically. Yeah. Don't you? You try to save your body, you'll lose it. Mm. Try to save your soul. Just, don't worry about your body. Yeah. Don't worry. Don't, Allah will take care of that. L l last couple questions before we conclude. So, okay. so people understand uh, things in context. When you said you you believe uh, what you believed about the coronavirus virus being a hoax, what what do you actually mean? I believe I don't believe it was an accident that it was um um so you be, you believe it's synthetic that it was man-made oh yeah oh yeah I don't believe it's naturally occurring at all no it's weaponized some people had strokes from this some people had heart attacks from this some people lost their eyesight from this some people were their 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 organs turned into blood into water you haven't have you this virus is doing things to people you would not believe somebody broke it down and said some of the hiv is in this virus there this virus is a frankenstein virus this is not just a naturally occurring virus mm -hmm. no i'm sorry i can't show you the the sheet the government sheet that proves this look I, i've seen enough to know i have seen enough to know um there is paperwork about it there are scholarly people saying this but you know some a lot of times they become more once i see it it becomes more and more difficult to find it on the internet. Funny about that. You know, you see something and then you go, wow. And then you look for it again and you go, where'd it go? <laughs> mm -hmm. It's happening. That's happening too. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, whatever. The what conspir there's one big conspiracy going on. Okay. The conspiracy is this. Shaitan is trying to uh, make his last stand. And he's doing everything in it, and he's kicking out the jams and he's doing everything in his power to to win. And he knows and he's not going to. 
so all he's doing is trying to gather as many souls as he can to take to the hellfire. He knows he's not going to win. He knows that that's not his objective is to win. His objective is to take all these people to hell. And that's why I try to talk to them with so much passion because I know what's going to happen to them. And it hurts me to let them go when they're being obstinate or they're being cage fighting and stuff, yeah. but you have to. Yeah. The most compassionate thing, the most compassionate thing you can do sometimes is to let someone go when they when they when they don't want to, uh -huh. you know, you know, and, and, that, and, and, and go ahead. And what? I wanted to say something else. I'm going to name names here. I'm going to name names. You ask me who are they? I'm going to tell you right now, the Zionists are major players. The Zionists are major players and they've been major players since before the Bolshevik Revolution. They killed 20 million people in Russia. They arranged World War One. They arranged no, they didn't. They arranged the United States to get into World War One, so they could get Palestine from England in return. See, people wonder why did the, why did Germans hate Jews so much? Why did Germans hate Jews so much? I don't know how much time we got, but I'll tell you a quick one. A quick one. Jews were getting kicked out of places all over all over Europe. They weren't doing good, you know. And then Germany took them in. I think it was 17 or 1800s, and they flourished. The Jews were welcomed with omen arms in in in, um, in Germany in 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 that time, seventeen eighteen hundred. Now your blood, your father and mother are Jewish. Yes, okay. they were. Okay, and um, so what happened was this: World War One started. England was fighting. Um, England and Germany were fighting. Who I don't know who was fighting who, but the thing was that England was not good didn't look good for england to win the zionists the german jewish zionists went to england and said if we can get america into world war one to help you win could would you give us palestine and they said okay and that's how the balfour declaration came into being and that's how world war one got into world, how the united states got into world war one was the german zionists negotiated with the United States to get into World War One, And then what happened was England turned around and granted Palestine in the Balfour Declaration to, uh, you know, to the Zionists. And they and in the Balfour Declaration, they said, everybody's going to be play nice and live together and be peaceful. And it was never entered into in good faith. They, as soon as they got their foot in the door, you know what happened. Just look at it now. Look at it now. Mm -hmm. So um, they've been playing. This is um, no, I'm not anti-Semitic. <laughs> they're 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 major players, but they're not the only players. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, you can't. I mean, how can you be anti-Semitic? You're Jewish. I mean, your your lineage is Jewish. A semi. The word Sem semite means someone from Southwest Asia. Most of those Jews over there are not Semites. Yeah. They're, they're from Eastern Europe. They're Ashkenazis. A Semite is a person. The Palestinians are the Semites. <laughs> yeah. A Semite is a person from Southeast, Southwest Asia, yeah. which is Asia Minor. Yeah. Um, these people running around like Netanyahu's from Poland. He's not a, he's not a Semite. He's yeah. accusing people of anti-Semitism. So I, I don't want people he's to get the... Get, yeah, I don't want people <laughs> anyway, to get the... You understand. Yeah, I understand. Uh, but just to clarify, you know, uh, Jews were actually fleeing persecution coming into Muslim lands and there was always a, a pretty good relationship uh, uh, saving the Jews from, there's a Dr. Warnstein, I believe, professor who said uh, that Islam saved the jury, I meaning the Jewish people, it's in the Jewish Chronicles. Yes. Yeah. So. Yes, a lot of Muslims did a lot of saving of Jews during World War II. Yeah, because yes. but there's this lot, there's this a uh, lot of uh, propaganda that Muslims hate Jews and all of this well there is a picture of some imam with hitler meeting and talking and they use that to say oh the muslims were involved and i don't know about that but i i know more stories about good decent muslim people who saved jewish people during the war mm -hmm. and um this it's, it's our commandment we're supposed to work with the oppressed help the oppressed whoever they are not just muslim oppressed it's a commandment from allah yeah. if somebody's getting oppressed and we don't help them this is this could put us into the hellfire. Yeah, we don't want to do that. Yeah. So I guess from all of this, uh, the reality is that uh, we have a purpose. This life is not purposeless. That there is a creator. He sent guidance. You found it. You are a truth seeker. You found it in Islam. The signs were clear. 
and now Islam gives us hope in all of this in a world of darkness uh, there's much good in the world but there's also these like we just talked about uh, the satanic forces uh, but sometimes for a lot of people it get overwhelming it could just seem dark and gloomy but there's this life is short it's a test and this helps us to uh, stay focused on the real life and that's in the next life being good human beings in this life worshiping one and only one God and hopefully reuniting in Jannah and paradise and that's where the justice truly will prevail on the day of judgment and these people they those people we talk about they they'll be uh, brought to account if they're not brought to account in this life I ask a lot of guide as many of them as possible I mean yes away from the darkness I mean and the rest of them the rest of them whatever he wants to do with them yeah let, because that's I, his business I S L A M Islam says love all mankind and that's why we're sharing this message peace acquired by submission to the one and only one creator of the heavens and earth God Almighty Allah thank you very much for sharing your time with us and again uh, your story and some of these other things that we talked about thank you thank you Eddie God, may Allah bless you and, and, and give you everything in abundance that you need to continue doing Ameen. what you're doing and, and may Allah guide you and I hope to see you in, in this life and if not in this life maybe we'll take a run in Jannah together inshallah God Insha thank you okay. thank you so much assalamu alaikum wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh